a pretty relaxed talk guided by Hayden mm -hmm. um, and your questions that you've posted on the Facebook page and sent through to CSE so. So yeah, it's just gonna run from one to two and um, I'm just gonna pass it over to Hayden now. So. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, hi everyone. I have more people here than come to my lectures sometimes. This is very exciting. Um, so, imposter syndrome. I mean, I, uh, yeah, you can ask questions throughout the talk. Um, I probably have like 25 minutes, I guess, of things to talk about off the top of my head. Um, so feel free to ask questions. I might park some till later, depending on what they are. Um, but I, I don't really have like, slides because I think it's you know this is meant to be more of a conversation but I have found mm -hmm. through years of talking that if people can see something in front of them then um, it it might help and I was wondering if I could have screen sharing permissions if that's all right excellent okay um, so I won't put these up for most of it because there's mainly just like one thing I want to talk about. So, um, I mean, hi everyone. Um, we're going to be briefly talk about me. Um, we're going to talk about, I guess, my understanding of imposter syndrome and kind of the key parts of it and how to deal with it. And then I want to talk about um, how it's kind of fit into my life personally, and then talk a little bit more about the world of CSE because I know a lot of people had questions and comments around like CSE and leak code and all this other stuff but oopsie um, but I know that for a fact um, you know it's it's much broader than that like imposter syndrome really needs to be much broader than leak code and internships and that kind of stuff because it affects people it affects people very broadly so um, some of you know this I'm a 27 year old computer science graduate at UNSW so I studied there from 2012 to 2016 um, I work full time co running a startup at the moment, and I teach casually at UNSW to pay the bills because the startup does not pay the bills. Um, and I look forward to when the startup pays the bills so I can teach less, um, but still teach because I, I love I love UNSW students, they keep me on my feet. Um, I think that understanding people is really important. I was a podcast that CSE SOC was very generous to let me do recently. And in that, I talked about the importance of talking about money and the importance of, oh, hello, Eric. Loud Eric. Um, it, I talked about the importance of money and how it, parents don't talk about money enough because if you understand how you're like, how wealthy your parents are or like what their income is, you can actually put their experiences in context, right? And I think it's really important to put people in context, whoever it is. And another part of this is actually understanding people. So, just a couple of quick things about me, some, some just about my life and some about my personality generally that I don't really talk to people about. And I guess some of the stuff I've never really communicated to students before um, since I started teaching. But um, so I grew up in a small town called Ballina. It's up on the North Coast. A lot of people hear about it these days because it's the number one trip. It's the number one holiday airport to fly into right now with the Brisbane border shut because everyone's going to Byron Bay. Um, but it's really just a town full of old people um, there's more old people's homes than any other kind of uh, entertainment that exists there. Um, I grew up largely without any friends. I don't think I really had any friends till I was like 14. I mainly just spent primary school like roaming the schoolyard, just like looking at trees or something like that. Um, and I, in terms of like what I wanted to study, I always kind of knew I was interested in stem stuff, but I didn't really settle on software until I finished high school. Um, I think it was one of those things like doing the UAC preferences. I was like, yeah, software sounds like a cool way to do STEM stuff. Um, Cause I just kind of fell in love with it towards the end. Uh, I worked very, 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 very hard in year 12. Um, I've never really cared much for academia. I'd rather watch YouTube or do something more fun. I don't really like studying for the sake of it, but I didn't like my family and I didn't like Ballina. So I studied anyway to get enough money um, cause if you study hard, you need to think you're worth something and they give you cash for some reason. So I wanted cash to, uh, get out of home. And sometimes I actually thank, thank that upbringing. Cause I think if I lived in a happy little life in Sydney, I probably wouldn't have worked very hard, um, which wouldn't have been good for me. And then I moved to Sydney when I was 18, um, just grabbed my stuff and came here and I've lived here for the last eight years. 
just in terms of, um, I guess, my personality, which is the thing I don't talk about much and kind of ties into a lot of the imposter syndrome thing. So I was a very, very, very shy kid. Um, it's because my father is a scary man. Um, I was scared to talk. I was scared to be emotive. Uh, I got in trouble once for making a joke. I always, I tell a few of my friends a story. We were going to the beach in a car and I made a joke and dad was like, stop being such a little shit. And then he turned the car around and we went home and I was like, okay, no beach today. Um, and I just very scared child. Um, I used to play soccer for eight years. Um, I would never try and kick the ball at the goal out of fear of missing it. I scored one goal in my years of playing soccer. And that's because for anyone who plays soccer, there was a corner kick and it landed on my foot and it bounced into the goal and everyone thought it was intentional. And that's the highlight of probably my soccer career. Um, I grew up in a very poor household. We moved around a lot and my parents got divorced at 13. Um, because a lot of this stuff, I've probably been dealing with a lot of depression since I was 14, um, pretty much ongoing for the last like however long. Uh, if anyone has dealt with depression for a long part time, you know that it gets to a point where you're like, yeah, it's just life now, you know, it's like whatever, <laughs> just how it is. Um, and I started dealing with really acute anxiety when I was like 19 and I came to uni. And I think for anyone as well that deals with anxiety, um, Acute anxiety is like more on the, the like the PTSD side, um, more so than like the generalized anxiety stuff. So like, I'm not one of those people that's just like generally anxious about things all the time. You know, those friends, like I have friends, they're like my sweetest friends. They're just like always like vibrating kind of thing. Um, but for, for me, it's more like it comes in really aggressive waves and then moves on. Um, and I, I really like the strangest thing about me personally, and, and even just tying into imposter syndrome myself is like a lot of people seem to think that um, I'm a very outgoing person and that I like am very confident generally. But a lot of that stuff has largely only come up since I came to uni, um, because before that I didn't really do anything. And most of it started when I started doing a lot of teaching and getting involved in student groups when I was in like third year, um, which I'll kind of come back to. So. That's a bit about me. I love this photo. I only found this a few years ago. It reminds me of childhood because I tried to fit in as best as I could. And here is me desperately attempting to and failing in the background. Um, so yeah, also you can see the, the diversity of our regional towns in New South Wales. Um, so imposter syndrome, um, someone asked at some point, um, oopsie, is, I lost the chat again, um, is like, can we define it? broadly um and i mean you can google this stuff but in general it's like when you don't feel good enough but you are or when you're feeling out of place but you actually belong right like so we're all in parts of communities that we don't feel like we're part of or we don't feel like we hold the identity of um but uh and there's also times where we we're just part of something maybe you know you're doing an internship or you're doing an exam and you just don't feel good enough when you are and I thought a lot about, I, I figured rather than kind of finish with this, it's good to start with this is like, what, um, what are like the key things about imposter syndrome that I've learned from my own experiences feeling it and then like how to deal with those. So, I mean, the first one is pretty, and most of this is pretty obvious to people. I think, I think people are very smart. Um, it's like trying to compare your, like what you often do is you really do compare your best, uh, your worst with other people's best a lot of the time. So many people you know have had like terrible experiences or done terrible things or just had, you know, awful achievements. Like I know students in CSE who other um, people like look up to. And like, I know those, those students themselves like have just applied for five internships and not gotten them, you know? And that's like a common story is like, everyone's like, what's the, like they look at the absolute worst things that happen to them and then they benchmark it against the absolute best things that happen to them so i generally encourage people to hunt for dark stories i call them um anyone you know that you look up to or makes you feel like an imposter is go and talk to them and ask them things like what's the worst thing that what's what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you in the last two years what is like what is the 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 biggest failure you've had in the last three years um and again I, i'll talk about a few of these in my experience but just trying to canvas these first um the second one is that like everyone feels like an imposter, but not always at the same level. And I think it's something to keep in mind. And, you know, it's something I've learned in recent years because I feel like an imposter to a lot of people constantly in my own kind of world and life. But there's a lot, all these people as well that feel that towards me, which I find very perplexing, right? And I'm sure many of you as well um, 
have that same experience where you're kind of like you have these people that look up to you and they're like wow how are you so good and you're like what the fuck <laughs> and then like you yourself are like looking at people and being like god damn it i will like never get to that point or i will never be good enough for that point um i think a third one is sometimes you are an imposter um and uh you just have to accept that frankly like you are an imposter like b b because because when you like look at things, right? And I've said this in I've said this in a lot of um, I've said this in a lot of lectures and things I've given students. Your life is like a big bucket, and when you like assess yourself, most people tend to do it in these little silos. They tend to be like, "Wow, I can't program C, but so and so can program C," or like, "I really suck at using this particular tool," or "I really suck at like working with people," and so and so is so good. And the reason I point this one out is because you can't I can't really stand around and be like oh you know everyone's great at everything and you know you don't need to feel silly about it because the fact is is that we all make choices in our lives about what matters to us um, I always tell people like I love food <laughs> right and I love cooking and I love like learning about food and I would waste like an hour a day just watching YouTube videos of food like people preparing food people talking about food and I just love talking to people about food. And as my friends know, I just like obsessed with that. And like, because of that, there's going to be students or other, you know, well, I shouldn't really benchmark myself against students too much, but like, there's going to be other professionals out there that are like learning cool things. Like friends the other day, like, oh, I just learned what a Kubernetes cluster was. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I don't know what the hell that is. Um, and like, if I try and say like, I feel like an imposter because they know that stuff, but I don't that's just completely undermining the fact that you care about different things to other people, right? Because like you, you, things matter to you. And I, I give another example. I don't, I don't like my family that much. I really don't interact with them at all. Um, I don't like, um, I don't have, I'd like live in a share house. I have nothing to do, right? Except work at the moment. And then people like, wow, Hayden does a lot of stuff. Why can't I like, I wish I, I'm not productive. Like Hayden, it's like, you don't realize how freaking little I actually do with my time right now, right? But like some of you, I, I use the example, some of you have siblings, some of you have like young family members, like babies or toddlers in your house that you look after, or you have sick parents, or you have like a family business that's failing because of COVID, you know? And like, you should try and be proud of that. And th that's what I mean is like, so like, it's all well and good to talk about, like there are times where you aren't an imposter, um, where you feel like you are. But then there are times where you are just like not going to be hitting a standard, but often it's in a silo. It's in a silo and your life is much broader than that. Um, and you need to try your best to take a step back and actually look at everything that goes on um, and say to yourself, am I proud of who I am across everything I'm doing in my life? Not this particular thing. Because there are lots of things like I'm not happy with in my life. You know, like I look at, I look at people who exercise every day and I'm like, wow, I suck. And like, I'm not good enough like that, but you know, they've got different priorities and stuff like that too. Anyway, that one dragged on. Um, and the fourth one is, I guess, just a little bit more about dealing with it is that, I mean, the, one of the concepts of imposter syndrome that you'll hear people talk about a lot is that um, it doesn't really go away, right? It's not like a mountain to climb and then you get to the peak. It's, it's um, if anyone's played Super Mario 64, it's the endless stairs at the top of the castle. I don't know if that means anything to anyone, but um, it's, you won't really get over it and most people feel it and they carry on to feel it and you'll see there are very few people who are just like yeah i'm great i'm awesome and then they just like go on with their day uh, but the thing is you just kind of have to keep your head down and keep going um you know and, and again like i even saw some student like this this is the stuff i this is the stuff i like have all the time so i was like just look at hayden's linkedin profile and i was like, oh look at his linkedin profile and it's like you have to understand that like everyone, including you, I don't sit around all day looking at my LinkedIn profile being like, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. Like, that's not what I do. I'm sitting here all day right now dealing with a startup where we're trying to hire people and we're not hitting targets and we're running out of money. And I'm going, holy crap. I think I thought I knew how to run a company, but I don't think that we're going to get there, you know? And I'm worried that in six months, you know, we'll run out of money. And then it'll be just another story, like, you know, another failed startup story. And I've wasted, I mean, I put, I've done two years of free work and I put in 25,000 of my own money into this company, right? So it's like, and you see other people, like I have friends, I have a friend startup that I contracted for. He started like a year ago and he's just raised like $400,000 and the company's worth like $5 million. And you're like constantly in this distressing point. 
so again it's like you have to move forward with this stuff um and same for you like i point this out to people you many of you that are like i'm not good enough it's like have you stopped and realized that you're at unsw studying computer science like do you realize how many like we all live in these such bubbles but i guarantee you if you just went to like the mcdonald's in some crappy suburb in sydney i've learned not to give specific suburbs or i, I offend people but like some crappy suburb in sydney and you go to the mcdonald's and you just start talking to the person there and you talk about their life and you tell them what you can do and you tell them what you're doing you're like yeah you know i just like i study software engineering and like i, I make they'll they'll just think you're a wizard they'll be like holy crap, this person has like figured out life. I wish I could have been as organized as them. I wish I could have been as focused as them. I wish I had the motivation to not smoke pot and drink all the time and actually do work. Like you live in this tiny little bubble in computer science. Um, and you, you would be amazed how many people outside of that um, are just gobsmacked by it. So um, just a few things about my own kind of like I want to just canvas some of the key things in my life that people think are achievements and like point out um point out like the how slightly untrue that is um most things that people think I did are cool or do a cool are just so far from perfect um I could give people a good example right like again for any for all these people who are sitting on my LinkedIn um the very first internship I had it was at a web dev company. They paid me $25 an hour as a contractor. I found them on some jobs website. Um, and people kind of look at that and they think like, wow, you know, you like had an internship in first year, right? They think, well, like I didn't have an internship in first year. I mean, a lot of students these days tend to, but, um, but like when I look at that place, I was only working two days a week. Um, they didn't pay me for a bunch of stuff. My boss used to yell at me all the time. And I had like crippling anxiety to do with this job um, and I couldn't sleep most nights that I like had work, right? So I pretty much, I pretty much stay up all night before a work day being worried about the work day because they were getting me to do some stuff with like WordPress and CMSs and Git before we taught Git. And I had no idea what this was. And all day at work, I was like asking people questions. And eventually they were like, you don't know enough stuff. So we can't employ you any more than that. Um, so, you know, that was a crappy job and it was miserable. I tell people like I was so shitty. I was working in... I think Brookvale, has anyone lived in Brookvale? DY? No? Excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, Brookvale, DY. So I was like, I was like living in Maroubra, Matraville and I was commuting every day to like DY and it was just like the worst experience of my life. But it's so funny because people are just like, oh wow, that's incredible that you kind of did that stuff. But like, not really. Um, and it's the same with probably the main thing I ever did at uni was um, uh, I ran Sunswift for about three-ish years um, is the easiest way to put it. It's the giant fat solar car that sits on campus behind J17, K17. And like, what was really weird was I kind of fell into that because my old academic supervisor for my scholarship was like, oh, you know, you should go and help out with this thing. And I was like, well, I just program websites. I don't know what that is. And they really needed someone to help take up some leadership. And I spent the first, I spent the first entire year of that um, team thinking that I was doing a terrible job because I wasn't good with, I didn't know anything about mechanics or electronics. Like it's a solar car. It's not a website. Um, this thing, this thing drives and uh, electricity powers wheels and turns things. And the team was full of people just talking about crap. I had no idea what they were talking about. And I was meant to try and manage them and control them. And none of them were listening to me. Um, and I was like, I'm not an extrovert. I'm not like a natural born leader. I don't know how to like you see those people at groups, right? Like, has anyone been to a party and there's that big, tall, six foot person who's just like, all right, everyone, let's go to the next thing. And you're like, oh, look at the commanding nature of that person. Um, but I like, I like to talk about Sunswift because one thing that surprised me about Sunswift was feeling like, feeling like this useless person all the time. And they were previous team leaders. They were like 30 year old men. The person before that was like a, 28 year old woman who herself had built this car the previous car and driven it across the desert you know like these powerhouses of human beings and I was just like a 21 year old idiot um but you know it turns out like and this is the case with a lot of things quite often what you think are your weaknesses can end up being very helpful um and like I give you a good example I have a few employees with the startup right now and the employee that has ended up getting the most work the highest pay and all of this has been the person who actually does not know the most about software 
And that's actually worked very well in their favor because every time we have to do something, they are very hesitant to make decisions unless they actually chat about it, right? They actually want to figure out more. They're, they're really scared. And you'd be surprised how much you can turn anytime you're scared about something into a very strong, um, very strong strength into a strength um, to drive you forward. Because what happens, if, what happens if you don't feel like you're good enough in a group of people or you're scared? You will ask questions, right? You will seek validation. Um, you will seek acceptance. And when you do these things, funnily enough, that's actually what they call teamwork, right? It's like working with people. It's being like, I'm really scared and not confident. So I'm going to go and figure that out. And the people who are like, I know what I'm doing. Um, they're the ones who often fall on their face. So I ended up having a very good time leading this team. And most of it was because I was so anxious about upsetting people. And I was so anxious about getting things wrong. So everything I did was fairly consultive and trying, like it wasn't like marching orders. It was like trying to talk to people all the time. Um, and you learn a lot about yourself. Like one thing I learned a lot about is that my, for some reason, most of my experiences in life have driven me towards thriving in like one-to-one -one relationships. Like I'm not very comfortable in group settings. And someone pointed this out to me a while ago. It's like, if you like, you know, I'll go to like a party. I haven't been to a party in years. Um, I'll go to like some kind of gathering um, and I'll be like standing around four people and I have a natural inclination to kind of wander off with one of them and just chat, you know, just like, cause that's like the, the environment I thrive in. And you know, what's really funny about group work and stuff and like leadership, Pe people think that it's actually um, like standing in front of a group of 10 and just like commanding. But in actual fact, if you're doing leadership properly, what you're often doing is you're managing 10 individual relationships at the same time. You're talking to these people, you're understanding them. You know, if you're in a team of three and the only time you interact with your team of three is when you talk to your team of three, you're not going to build like a strong group like that, right? So sometimes that kind of confidence can really set you back. Um, just a few more things. Uh, people like to dig my stuff on the internet and about once a fortnight, someone messages me or tells me when they see me, they're like, oh, I saw that you did a TEDx talk um, six and a bit years ago. And then they'll say something very nice about it and they'll be like, wow, that was like really great. And this, and I am like, okay. Um, and it's just very funny to me, these things, right? Because, and again, back to the imposter syndrome thing, people literally talk to me and you can hear the undertone. They're like, I can't believe that you did that. That's crazy. You know, like that was inspirational and blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't think it was. And um, it's just so perplexing to me because I remember specifically, right, at the time, I got this email from, by the way, TEDx talks are a dime a dozen. Seriously, you can like, you could probably even buy one on eBay. Um, if there's an X next to the TED, it's worth very little, in my opinion. If you see like the TED talks without the X at the end, that's like the proper ones that like happen like twice a year or something and those big conferences. And they're like, they're like the Mecca. But um, yeah, like I got invited to do one of these things. And the people, the people I was talking with, there was like a woman who'd lost her child and was talking about the importance of love. There was like, there was a couple of um, there was a couple of people that were transitioning M2F and um, F2M, and they were like chatting in a panel. I, I, the person before me was a, a child soldier in Sudan that had been shot and came to Australia to become a stand-up comedian and was giving a TED talk just before me about the importance of laughter in the times of great misery. And then they were like, oh, and we want you to talk about why it's really great that you and a whole bunch of other privileged kids decided to build a solar car and drive it in a circle a hundred times, you know? Um, and like that entire time I was like, this is a stupid talk. And I still think compared to the other talks, it was a stupid talk. I prepared for it terribly. I was so busy with the actual solar car team that I didn't actually write the damn thing till a day or two before. And obviously you all like would look at that if you saw it and were like, wow, that's a great talk because your reference point is nothing. You know, your reference point is like, you didn't expect that. But my reference point was all of the cool things we do. There was a bunch of people I didn't think. There was a bunch of stories I told terribly. Um, it's a bad talk. Like, I'm uh, sorry, it's, an, it's a very average talk, right? It's a very like 5.5 .5 out of 10. I've never watched it. I was there, you know? And like, I don't wanna watch it. And it's so weird because that's my experience of it. I'm very glad I did it. It was a cool experience, you know what I mean? I'm not like embarrassed by it, but I'm certainly not proud of it. But then suddenly it's a tenant now that people use to say like, that's really cool. And that's what I mean before about, um, uh, you know, people people are like really just comparing very strange things here um it felt weird it was embarrassing i forgot a lot of stuff but you don't see that because everything looks like a polished turd in hindsight 
right? Like that's a very strange thing about life in general. Like you think about, I mean, if any of you here are tutors, you've probably seen the same thing. You've probably seen a student come up to you and be like, I really like your teaching. You're a good teacher. And you're like, oh, oh, sweetheart. No, <laughs> I am very much not a good teacher. Right? Um, and, and it's the same kind of thing there. Uh, as well as that, um, a few more things before I jump into the CSE stuff. I've mentioned the startup life and how I don't feel like our company is going to succeed. And you know what's funny? Like I tell you this all the time. I said this in the podcast thing I did. Um, our, our company is not kicking goals right now like it should. That doesn't mean it's like failed, but it's like there are a lot of startups out there with a lot of people running it that are succeeding right now. Very quickly, um, you know, kicking goals. Um, and there's a, there's a more than 50% chance that, again, this recording in a year is kind of like a funny meme. Um, remember that time I was in that company before it failed, you know, like that, that's more than a 50% chance that me talking about this right now turns into that. Um, and, you know, every day I'm up late trying to figure stuff out and I'm making mistakes and I'm pissing people off. Um, and I, I don't have a good relationship with one of my developers right now. They keep annoying me. So I just ignore their messages because like, I don't want to talk to them because it stresses me out and they're not getting any work done. Right. And there's just like, that's not a good way to deal with things. It's just a temporary thing. Um, but it's like, you don't, you look at all this and it's like, I guarantee you if this startup goes well, and we have like a good team of developers in a year and a half, people will be talking about like, oh, isn't it really cool that there's that startup and um, it did really well. And isn't it crazy that Hayden did this and that. And it's like, it's so freaking weird how people polish turds like that, right? Because once something goes well, I mean, they call it survivor bias as well. It's like, it all, it's all just okay. It was always part of the plan. That's the big thing. People always see things and say it's part of the plan. It was part of the plan that um, you know, like another example is Sunswift, right? Just last thing on Sunswift. I was part of five different things in Sunswift. We broke a world record in 2014. We did a solar car race in 2015 and came third. We, well, four things really. And then in 2017, we attempted a race and pulled out. And in 20, what was I forgetting? I'm sorry, let me start again. 2014 world record, 2015 a race, came third. Again, in 2015, we tried to make our solar car the first road legal solar car in the world, in Australia. We failed at that. We had to give up on it after like a year of work. And in 2017, after a year of building a car, a critical component broke and we had to pull out of the race and drive 2000 kilometers back to Sydney, having lost something that we'd all been working a year from. But again, when people think about this stuff, no one comes up to me and is like, oh, Hayden, you were part of that car that broke and sucked and failed and you had all had to go back home when all the other teams did well you know no one talks about that do they they just think like oh there's all the good stories so just back to my first point um please hunt for people's dark stories most people are nice people talk to them ask them what their failures are ask them what their biggest anxieties are about their own achievements right now right i know there's a lot of people out there that like say um richard buckland right i've been lucky enough to have a lot of conversations with richard um, and if you go talk to Richard, you'll realize he's, he's a deeply worried man about everything he's doing. He's in a constant state of thinking most of most initiatives he's dealing with are in dire straits. Um, and you see this for most people, just go and talk to people. Um, cause most people are miserable. There's the occasional freak. Who's just like, who's just like really happy. Everything's good. Um, they know what they're doing. It was all part of the plan. Just to get off that topic. Cause I don't want to talk too much. Um, there were a lot of questions that came through about CS in particular, and I get it that most it's a CSE talk and most people are thinking like, I, I feel like an imposter in CSE. Um, I, I feel those things too, but for me, the bigger, the bigger ones have always been larger than that. Um, so that's why I wanted to talk about them. But there were two kind of big things that came up in the questions. Uh, the first one was, and I've just kind of summarized them there, here. I don't feel like I'm a proper CS student. Other kids get it and I don't. They do stuff in their spare time and I don't. Other people feel so confident that they've made the right degree choice. Right, they're all kind of on the same thing. I think there's, I think there's two parts to this. Um, the first one is a simple one. I mean, the first one is that 
all these people that get it, you probably don't see the hours that they spend not getting it. You probably don't see the hours they spend questioning it. You probably don't see, maybe it's a third year <clears throat> who really likes computer science and you're a second year. You don't see that for the first two years they didn't, they weren't sure if they wanted to do it. You know, so again, that just goes back to really like talk to these people and dig in. But something that's really specific to computer science, and again, I talked about this in the podcast for anyone who bothered to listen to that. Um, computer science is a very, very strange field. It is really unlike any other field in computing. And <clears throat> the reason for that is it's effectively, so in any kind of career, you have the people that are just obsessed with it, right? Like in maths, you have the people that are just like, they go home and they write math equations. That's what they do on a Sunday. They wake up and they start writing maths on their wall. Um, in other fields like physics, you have people that just go stargazing every single night um, or, you know, just random stuff like you're Joe Wolf's, right? Does everyone know Joe Wolf? Does anyone know Joe Wolf, the physics guy? Computer science students often don't because I think it's not part of the degree. Um, but if you did, if you did physics because you do comp or you did a dual degree, then you know Joe Wolf. Um, he's an absolute weirdo, right? In the best kind of way. He's just like obsessed with science. Like you can just tell it, it, it completely encapsulates his being. I tell people this story because um, <clears throat> he supervised SunSwift in 2015 for our last leg from Adelaide to Sydney. Um, and I was in charge of the team and I was like, oh, Joe Wolf, you know, like what a cool guy. So when I, when I arranged the cars that day, I, I put him in the, the seat next to me while I was driving, you know, cause I was a dictator, I guess. And I, um, and I remember he said to me, did, did one of the funniest things I've ever seen. We were just like driving along. It, we were in like the, around Wagga Wagga and it was like 5 PM. And he, I just like see him in the side of my thing. And he's like, he's like doing this and he's like wiggling his hands. And he's like looking, and then I look and he's like looking in the side mirror like the little wing mirror of the car. And then he just goes, ah. And I was like, what? And he's like, the sun will set in six minutes. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> excellent. You know, like that's the kind of guy he is. He just loves this stuff. Like he's, he's playing with angles. He's thinking about science. Um, and there's these people in every kind of discipline, right? But what's different in computer science is you, you have those people at the top, but that gap is absolutely pulled down right like stretched right down and you have a huge number of people in computer science that are what you would call hobbyists and if anyone has friends in other kinds of engineering degrees like mechanical engineering electrical engineering civil engineering what you will find if you have these friends find me how many mechanical engineers give a damn about mechanics outside of what they have to do to achieve their goal Right, like how many mechanical engineers do you have? You're like, what are you up to today? And they're just like, oh, I'm just building like a testing rig to see how strong some concrete is. They don't do that on a Sunday, but I'm sure we all have computer science friends. You're like, what are you up to today? And they're like, oh, I'm just trying to install a plugin to VS Code to get the, the thing happen, whatever the hell that is, the thing happening. And there's a ton of those in CS. They're not a majority at all. They're probably like, I'm just making up numbers, maybe 10 to 20% of the people. Right. But in other in other fields, they're like literally insignificant. And most people just consider them as like those oddballs, not in a bad way, but just those oddballs. But in computer science, you have this huge hobbyist majority of people. Now, like a phrase that I might use is that there are often two types of people in CS. There are people who code to live and there are people who live to code. Right. There are people who wake up every day um, and they code or they play with software because that is what they consider to be an interesting and fulfilling life, right? Um, and often these are the people that end up going and doing a lot of research. Um, they end up at a lot of big tech companies doing really cutting edge stuff because they just love it. Like a good, a good year for them is if they've solved a software problem, you know? Um, and that's not a, a bad thing um, at all. And I'm not trying to stigmatize that at all, but it's much more prevalent in computer science and therefore it's much easier to see it as like a as a mass of people that you're not part of right because again in mechanics or electronics if you see those people you're just like oh that's trevor everyone knows trevor it's that one person um whereas in computer science you're like it's most of my class is how people think about it it's a ton of my friends it's all those people i see tutoring and hanging around at the labs late do doing stuff um, and then there's the second category of people, and I'm trying not to be too binary about this because it is it is a bit more, uh, you know, spectrumized than that. Um, but the other type of people are the people who live to code. Oh wait, sorry, I got that the wrong way around. <laughs> sorry. The first ones I meant are live to code. 
because that's what they do. They're alive to. I got that back to. Um, they're the serious um, people. The ones who, the ones I said, are defined by a good year for them as if they absolutely like smashed through software problems and did some cool things at work. The second group of people, which is the most of people, are the ones who code to live. And like I would fall into that category. I like software. It's why I study it. It's why I work in it. But I don't like it that much. My aim in life is not to be like if I die and software engineer is on my tombstone or like solve programming problems as like how people remember me, I think I screwed up pretty bad, right? Like my aim in life is really simple right now. It's really, really simple. I want to stay healthy, keep learning random shit like how to cook food and make enough money that I'm not poor, right? That's like what my goals are in life, you know? And when I'm 40, I doubt I'm going to care much about my career. I'll probably care about whether or not my like potential children will be like hitting other children or ending up in prison or something like that. And the thing is, I think one thing I see a lot is people in computer science, they will look at a lot of people who do um, that. They are someone who uh, codes to live and they'll look at a lot of people who live to code. And they're just, they're just different types of people a lot of the time. So when you're like, I'm impossible, they just, they want different things out of life than you, you know? And they're not actually that much in a majority. And then you'll see there's a lot of people as well who are in the, like the code to live camp. Again, I'm trying, it's a bit oversimplified, but they're in this camp of code to live, but they, um, uh, but they try and start living to code because that's what their friends are doing, right? They want to like fit in. They want to, they want to get into this stuff more and learn more. So they get dragged along to hackathons and they get dragged along to all these leak code things. And then all those other people that aren't feeling confident with it, look at this mass of people and say, holy hell, I'm not part of the crew, right? I'm not like doing it good enough. So um, I, I think that the takeaway of all of that is just, you know, try and think about those two categories of people, right? Because there are people out there who just really love it and that's awesome because we need those people. Because, like, you know, I have friends who are like many of your ages, like 21 year old, just got employed at Google, paid more than I'm going to get paid for the next few years for anything. Um, and they love their work. And that's really good. And that's what they do. They wake up every day because like they want to be a professional in their area. Um, and they want to have like a reputation in that area. And that's awesome. Um, but if you feel like you're out of place, it's often because you don't want the same thing. Right. Your life is not defined by that. Um, Jack said, hobby CS is super accessible compared to other engineering disciplines. Yes, it is. Um, there's actually some great research. I've mentioned it before about um, they, uh, there was a great piece of research I read years ago about they can correlate the decline of women in, you have like, I mentioned this in the podcast again. I'm sorry for anyone who's listened to it. Women in STEM has been on like a slow increase for like forever. And then there's like a point in computer science where the computer science numbers globally aren't actually very good. And there's a lot of studies to show they're going down. Um, and they actually correlate a lot of those changes to uh, around the time of like the Apple computer, 1984 and stuff, because when they started releasing personal computers was when you started seeing people. Could you imagine like if you were if you were someone in the 1970s and you worked with computers, you were a scientist, right? Like you were a scientist, just like a physicist or something like this. But nowadays, when you think about a programmer, you think about a hobbyist, right? You think about the person with their laptop and their Alienware, something rather. Um, and they talk about that. That's actually a, a huge part of the accessibility issues generally. And it all ties together, right? Like, um, you know, why, why would I, I can't speak for women at all, but like, I would have no doubt that a big portion of like, what's a difficulty with being in the field all ties back to this stuff about not feeling part of it, not feeling welcome, not feeling like you're part of the community or feel the identity. Um, and that's why it's so dangerous. I think that we have such a large hobbyist group inside of computing. Um, you know, and, and sometimes people will go through phases. Like when I was like 17 or 18, I was super into computers and just like figuring stuff out. And then I just stopped caring after that. Uh, the second kind of question that people asked before I just answer some questions more generally is people said like, should I be doing hackathons? Should I be doing side projects? Why is everyone doing leak code? And why am I not doing leak code? Um, so I guess a couple of things here. I, I, have, I have judged more hackathons than I've done hackathons because I don't like hackathons. Um, I've done very few side projects myself, um, and I've never, I, I, I don't know what leak, uh, sorry, I know what leak code is, but only because I've seen people do it and they've talked to me a lot about it, but I've never actually sat down and done it myself. Um, so I, I get it though, but the point is that I'm, uh, you know, I don't care for it. 
So some things on this. Um, if you're someone who is nervous and feels like you don't fit into like the hackathon model, like you're like, holy crap, what do you mean people just sit down for a day and build something? Right? That sounds that sounds stupid. And in fact, one of the problems with hackathons too is if you don't have very particular skill sets, you can't do shit. Right? Like if you're a first year student who's just learned C and you go to a hackathon, like what the hell are you gonna do for that time? They're gonna be like, wait, we're gonna ID ideate on a product and then we're gonna and it's like and then they'll take you to a workshop and like I've run them before. I see um I saw before that Tom was in the call. Hey Tom. Um like I ran one with Tom like in October last year and like you talk to people for an hour and a half and it's like it's like fun, but like sure as crap, no one's gonna learn anything, and go build something from it, right? Like you're talking you're talking to people like either people who already know it, you're gonna give them confidence, or people who don't, you're gonna like give them help. Um and I'm not trying to crap on uh those attempts to teach, but what I would generally encourage people to do is to if go to hackathons purely for fun and i'm sure you'll get this advice from other people find some friends who are equally as not um good at stuff as you and just go for fun the best thing i've ever done was i went and did the icm you know the programming competition the big australia in like asia pacific one i went and found two friends that know nothing as well and we went to that thing and for five hours we just failed at solving questions we would like write a whole question for an hour and then submit it. And then it would just be like wrong. And we'd be like, well, that was good. And then we'd look up at the scoreboard and like the top Australian team would have gotten like, the top Australian team got like four out of the 12 problems solved in like 18 minutes or some absolute bullshit, absolute craziness. And the thing is, is that the, the best part about these events is you get to meet people. You get to think about problems, even if you suck at solving them. Um, and if you do it with people that you feel like you're in sync with at an intellectual level, then you can't really lose because like if you go into these things not trying to win but actually just trying to have fun um you know then then you will actually have a lot of fun um and i think csc stock run a lot of these good events with hackathons and stuff but the point is don't go because you want to win or you think you have to produce something go because you want to have fun with friends and you want to have fun laughing at each other about how much you can do stuff i think they're the best kinds of hackathons where you're like let's you know we'll build like a web page with c somehow and then it's just like, it literally just says, hello. And you're like, what a great achievement we did. So um, in terms of side projects, I see there's a general push for people to do side projects and like learn stuff. I think that's good um, because like you need to learn outside of the classroom, right? You need to learn real things outside of the classroom to get good at what you're doing. And you can't always do that through an internship. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, Side projects are a good way to do that because it starts to get you into the the real world. Like once you actually have to go and do something real that isn't because a stupid one five three one lecturer told you to, um, then you actually learn a lot of skills. The one thing I would say about side projects though, and most of you are busy, most of you are stressed, most of you are time poor, and most of you lack the confidence to just sit down like me for eight hours and just be like, I'm gonna go do something. So I would strongly recommend that if people are interested in side projects, you don't go and just open up a, an application and start coding stuff but go and find some friends to do something with go and find a group of people that need some volunteers hell you know one of the best things you can do is you can go and like volunteer your time for a startup i can't tell you how many startups on campus would be looking for like free labor from like young computer science students even just to advise them right even just to be like we want to build a website and um, we don't know what to do because we're both commerce students because the thing is, when you focus on your like extracurricular work, if it's based on something that people need you for, you will actually learn something from it for two reasons. One is that what they get you to do will um, be usually more real than just you making some stuff up and say, I'm going to make a tic-tac-toe game. But secondly, um, if people need you for something, you will tend to do it, right? Like even when you're stressed, even when you have study, when people are messaging you being like, when are we going to get this done? You're more likely to actually do it. So um you know, uh, create uh, the UAV groups, just like, just, e just email some people, go around, like go to the, the student opportunity sites and just like ask people, like, do you need some help? Can I come to a meeting? Um, like, I just want to contribute some way. Uh, I think they're often great ways to get into those side projects. And just lastly on leak code, which is the last thing on my list. Um, <sighs> All I'd say about leak code is that <laughs> Squarespace. Um, 
leak code is a is a is a thing to teach you how to program really specific problems they don't reflect what you've learned and they're not going to reflect what you do in industry in the vast majority of cases but they're part of the interview process for big tech companies different companies do different things a lot of smaller companies will give you 24-hour programming challenges and just tell you to email them the solutions but big tech what they're really looking for is are you smart that's kind of what they want and generally the way they find that to be a solved problem most efficiently is to just like ask you a question like how do you merge all these numbers together and it's like okay um sure so it's it's one of those things i'm not good at it i failed technical interviews a bunch of times i failed i failed my dolby interview um i failed a few other small startup interviews i failed some big tech interviews for that same reason um if you don't feel like you're good at it, you're probably not. And you just need to sit down. And I have a lot of friends that do this. They have like an interview in a few weeks. They sit down, they waste an hour a day trying to get good at this stuff. They remember what they learned in comp 2521. They try and get better at it. They do the interview and then they forget most of it again. And in a year, they can't tell you what a goddamn red black tree is ever again. And they're never going to be asked what a red black. I've never heard the word red black tree uttered outside of comp 2511. Actually, I did have one friend once that was like, holy crap, today I did a red black tree at work. Um, everything's broken. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because it's 148 and I talked for way too long. Um, I do have a few questions as well that people have asked previously that I can answer, but if people have questions, please just like, please just keep, um, please just keep passing them on in the chat. Um, do I use algorithm questions to interview my engineers? No. So when I interview engineers, I, well, I mean, firstly, referrals are a big thing. Don't underestimate the power of networking. If there's someone I trust who says this person is good, I usually, I would just hire them, right? Um, in fact, our head of design, so I studied with the head of design of Spaceship. So Spaceship's a, um, it's a FinTech um, and their head of design and branding. So the person who did all this design, I studied with them um, and they, they, I messaged them once and was like, oh, I'm looking for a designer. And they're like, oh, my old designer needs work. And they're like, they were my second in command and they're the best. So I just emailed this person and was like, here's a job offer. Um, so please don't underestimate the power of networking generally, but, um, oh, Mark's here. Oh, hi, Mark. Um, I didn't expect Mark to be here. Um, you know, Mark, all the, all the 1531 students, they always have, they always make jokes. Like the other day, my postman yelled in my window earlier in the term, and there were students who were like, um, they were like, I bet that's Mark Chi screaming in his window. And I thought it was funny. I'm just going to like rock yeah. up past, past your, uh, past your lecture at your house and, and just yell at you, which is very different from like, if I turned up to someone's lecture in person at UNSW, that's kind of like, oh, okay, the lectures kind of look at each other's stuff. But when someone turns up at someone else's house, it's a little, little bit weirder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you live. Where do you live? Um, I'm actually in a, um, what's going to call it? A, a, a vat of organic fluids and they thaw me out every time I need to, um, need to lecture. And otherwise they just put me straight back in it. It's in the basement of K-17. That's, <laughs> that's why, that's why is that why you're not supposed closed. to say that, Mark? You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> is that why you look younger than me? I, I finally, I finally understand it now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. I'm going to mute myself again. This is your talk. <laughs> um, uh, ta -ta. I was reading something and then, oh yeah, um, interview things. Usually when I'm, usually when I'm employing people, I read their resume if I don't know them and I try and look at some previous work just on GitHub. And if they seem like, if it seems plausible, like if it seems reasonable um, that they're good unless they're trying to trick me, then I usually just go and throw them um, like four hours of paid work. And I say, go do this thing. I'm not going to help you come back to me after four hours. And if they do it, then great. Um, it's just easier. Like, I, I don't like any of that leak code crap. It just, I'd rather give people real work that we're doing and see how they respond to it. Um, so, yeah. Um, please ask some other questions. Again, I have three here, which are what technical skills are most valued in the industry? What general skills are most valued in the industry? And what's the best part of CS? Um, and I will just continue to answer those if people don't have more questions. So please pass them through. Um, what do I see in GitHub activity? I don't know. I don't know what you're asking there. Um, uh, <laughs> one, five, three, one students are here. Um, how, does soft, how does imposter syndrome uh, relate to other industries in the context of 
SW, what's SWA? Is that software engineering? Yes, just to check. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, sorry, how does, how does it relate to other industries in the context of software engineering? Um, in my experience, most people in other industries, like if you go work for Macquarie Bank or NAB or some insurance company, most people don't feel imposter syndrome from the software side of things, usually. Like they're not like, I don't feel like I fit in as a software engineer here. Um, there's two types of situations I see when people go to these other companies, like say Macquarie Bank is a classic example. Either they're people who really hate the CS industry and how kind of toxic it is. And even though like these other big banks are full of like some real heavy masculinity and some like very non-progressive values sometimes, they are kind of a more normal world in terms of like more normal people work there. Because fundamentally, like in our big tech companies, it's a big, big bubble, right? It's a giant bubble. Um, and some people like really like that normalcy, even if it's, it's like familiar dislikes, you know? Like you have a few bosses who are just big white men who are like kind of scary and miserable, but it's like, at least it's normal to people. So I find some people like those non like those other industry ones for that. The other kinds of people, I think, they usually just feel out of place in those places because they're not actually solving problems. Like in big tech, there's a lot of like people collaborating and actually building stuff and really user focused. Whereas in like other companies, there can be a bit more corporate bull crap and, and people leave it because they're like, it's just boring. It's slow. Um, you know, people aren't um, figuring that out. Yeah. Like Shay's. Uh, yeah. So Jack and Shay um, technical interviews suck. Um, and they're also very biased, right? Like I've, I've kind of always made this joke and I hesitate to put it on recording. It's like um, in big tech in particular, it's like, if there's, I kind of have this hierarchy, which is kind of like, generally, if you're like a white girl, you have a pretty good chance of getting a big tech job, like as a bias. And then you fall into like white guys and, and kind of ethnic girls, and then you fall further down. And I think, I think there's some terrible biases about it across, across the industry where it's like, I'm well aware that there's a lot of opportunities I've had um, because of my you know personal background. Um, and in particular, like, um, guys of ethnic background and even guys of ethnic background that don't have English as their first language. There's a huge bias against those a lot of the time, which I think is kind of terrible. Um, sometimes it's like under the mask of like communication, which is a really hard thing to figure out. Um, uh, but yeah, um, technical interviews suck. Um, I hate them. I've done them. I've done some well, I've done some bad. Um, if for anyone who's actually doing them, my advice is just, you know, be very clear that your job is to understand a problem more than find a solution. Um, that's like the old trap of tech interviews. They will, they will slap you across the face if you try and solve, if, if you solve a problem incorrectly and you didn't ask about it or clarify it, then that's really bad. So um, if you ever get given a technical interview question, uh, force yourself to ask at least 10 questions about the question they've given you before you start, before you put any code down. That's how they'll, that's how they'll get you. Um, uh, Jennifer said, how do you be okay being uncomfortable and use the uncomfort to find, try and find solutions rather than curl up and cry? Are you talking specifically about tech interviews, Jennifer? Um, that's a good question. Um, like, how do you just not be miserable? I mean, it's, it's hard for me to answer because I've, I've always had this like attitude of just keep going. Um, like, you know, even, even when you're like shaking and uncomfortable, it's just like try and try your best to just keep putting a foot forward um, and, and get through it. But, um, you know, di different people have different things that work for them. Um, like when I was working at my first job, uh, the one I hated, I used to just take like, I used to just take a bathroom break every hour knowing my boss would think I'm crazy or stupid or lazy. And I would just go to the bathroom and I would just sit there for like five minutes and I would just breathe for like five minutes. Then I go back in. Um, and it's very kind of hard to give general advice, but I guess, I guess I would just say, um, you know, find, find the things that calm you down and just embrace them. Even if you look silly, you know, like if you're in a situation like a work or professional situation where you're really being defined by your anxiety or discomfort, 
I go into those and I remember I'm not going to perform as well as others. Firstly, I need to accept that, right? Like if I'm nervous in an internship, others will do better than me. And that's a part of life. That's a part of being anxious. That's a part of being scared. That's a part of being stressed. But if I already know I'm not going to be the best, then I'm not going to try and pretend all the time to be perfect. You know, like I know there are things that help me stay calm and help me stay okay. And I will just try and embrace those and do those. Um, even if it's like listening to music at my desk when I shouldn't or something like this, you know, like I think, I think in general, your main priority should be to keep your head above water. And then secondly, to impress people. Because if your head's not above water, you'll do some dumb shit all the time. And people are smart. Don't, don't underestimate how much people will just read through you being a maniac too. Um, yeah, finding good coping strategies, um, reminding yourself what you're good at. Yeah, Tom's exactly right about that. And there's, there's a lot of things you are good at that other people aren't. You know, I know a lot of really bad programmers that are really good artists and really good and really good at dealing with design um, and, and try and find your groove with that. You know, if you, if you feel like you're good at something, try and navigate your way through and ask someone, you know, does anyone need any help on this front? Um, Ada's asked, where would you draw a line between helping startups working for experience and straight up doing unpaid work? I don't like encouraging unpaid work. I don't bring people on unpaid. I prefer usually to just not bring them on more of an ethics thing because I think it's a slippery slope and I'm a member of our industry, but I would probably work unpaid if I felt like it was worth it. Um, it it's really a thing I would just say, like leave to yourself. Like if you're working unpaid and you feel like you shouldn't be, then you probably shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like you, you probably have some value there, but there are times I've helped people out when I don't know enough. And I actually would feel weird getting paid because I feel like I'm really there to learn. And, and again, I in no way encourage unpaid work. As I said, I don't like to employ people unpaid, but I do pose myself the question all the time, which makes more sense doing an industry like job for free or paying someone to teach you about comp 2511, right? Like you kind of like, you know, you're kind of losing half, half the time at this age as well. Um, that was that's not particular to comp 2511 i just came up with a random code um a hi a uh do you have a clever way of dealing with toxicity in a team environment that could be related to imposter syndrome i struggle with this crap all the time i don't deal well with strong personalities in team environments um it's not my thing when people like commanding and dominating and they just like press over things um it's miserable and to this day every single day i find it anxiety inducing and i still lose sleep over like toxic dominance i would call it more than masculinity sometimes um but it's most often comes from men um but it's not even masculinity it's it's honestly just like these like intense personalities right sometimes it can be very soft and very passive aggressive but they still like just bull try and bulldoze things i don't think there's any way of dealing with it i think the way i deal with that one because i think it's just a fact of life is you really just have to say if i want to really get anywhere in my professional life i will never not find these people and I need to take this as a challenge to deal with them. And I will never be okay with it, but I can keep being less, like more okay with it and deal with harder and harder people. You know, and I look at the types of challenges I deal with now. And even though I still find them more, I, I find them anxiety inducing, they are far more complicated and big than the challenges I was dealing with five years ago. So just rise to the opportunity in that case, I think. It's managing people. It's a life skill. You just have to keep getting better at it. And it's not going to go away. Don't ever expect shitty people to go away. By God, they will not. Um, and what's funny is if you rise higher in the professional ranks, you run into a higher proportion of psychopaths statistically, right? There have been these great studies that show like 1% of CEOs are psychopaths because you kind of have to be to get to those, those roles. Um, so, you know, just embrace it like a challenge. Um, I know we're kind of close to time. I'm not sure how close you guys are to the, um, uh, the end, but I'm happy to keep answering a few more questions. Um, Debbie's asked, um, any advice for someone who's trying to break into this CS field after working in an entirely different field for the last five years? Um, so I, I can kind of half answer this. Um, one of the things that happened for me was when I joined SunSwift at the start of my third year, I essentially stopped programming. I just didn't care about it. I just wanted to like run a team. It was like leadership and solar cars were just a big thing for like literally years until like 2017. So like 2013, 14, 15, 16. This whole time, all I cared about was like making groups of people work together effectively. Like that's all that was on my mind. And I wouldn't say I was like out of the field, but I don't think I, I don't think I did anything in that time that was related to CS. Like my grades were terrible. I was like 
borderline failing everything. I just wasn't submitting assignments. I got a 50 in a call. I got a couple of 50s in courses. Um, it was absolutely terrible. And I, I lost most of my skills um, during that time. And what happened was, was towards the end of my time in Sunswift, I kind of started looking around and I was like, holy shit, I'm really stupid. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I don't know anything. I had like all these friends who were just like really doing some cool stuff in tech. And I was not in a position at the end of 2016 to probably get into big tech at that point. Um, because I just wasn't across the details and I would have failed tons of technical interviews and I just didn't know anything. Um, uh, you know, and I, I set myself a goal at the end of 2016, where I said, I've learned as much as I can in my twenties about not as much as I can. I've learned enough about leadership, management, teamwork, team building, high pressure scenarios, but I don't know enough about business and I don't know enough about software. I just like, don't, you know, like I look back to me tutoring in like 2014 and 15 and stuff. And I'm like, I really was just winging that. And I don't even know. I don't even know if I taught anyone anything. Um, but to get back to your question, Deb, sorry for the extensive context on that. Um, my advice, give it time and give it years even really like if you're like coming into CS now, even if you like devote a lot of your time to it, you should expect to not feel like you've really grappled with software, like really feel it unless you've really been like hitting it for a few years. And like a good example for that is that I got back into full-time web development after taking a long break from it for like literally years. I got back into it about 2018 or like the end of 2017. And only just now after doing it nearly full-time, am I feeling like I'm coming close to being like a, um, like a, what would you say, like someone who can talk about it without bull bullshitting, right? Um, and there's a lot I don't know, but I like, I know enough to feel like I could, I'm like a, a few of you know, I run comp 6080. I only feel like I could have done that in the last 12 months, right? Um, not before that. So really just give yourself time is what I would say. Um, so yeah, be patient. Um, what do you feel about taking the place of someone who would do a better job? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one thing I haven't talked about, which I told myself I wouldn't in this is like, I, I, I try very hard to remind myself that nothing matters every single day. Like that everything we do is stupid. This talk is stupid. Computing is stupid. Teaching is stupid. Everything is stupid because like, uh, there's like life, right? We're all going to die. Um, and like, what are we doing? <laughs> Um, and I think, I think you, know, you got to be careful with that mindset. <laughs> it's very, very dangerous. But um, I think that, I think that there's a certain amount of, um, you just have to remind yourself that anyway, that was a complete tangent. Um, everything Tom said is right about um, unpaid internships. I'm taking one unpaid intern over summer because I wouldn't hire them normally, but they can't find work. And I think they're a good person. And um and Tom's right, I'm feeling in the paperwork right now and you have to make sure they're learning something. So I wouldn't do an unpaid internship just to like do slave labor. Um, a great example of where I would say maybe it's worth spending some unpaid time is again, a lot of startups that just want someone who has some background to just solve problems for them. They're like, we need an app and you'll probably produce them nothing and they'll probably hate you at the end and who cares? You would have like learned something, right? Like you might start making a, a mobile app and you do this and you produce it and um, how to deal with unresponsive and less skilled teammates. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know if you're asking that. I feel like that's an actual comp one, five, three, one question instead of a live question, but um, my theory on everyone, most people are great. Sometimes they're just in the wrong spot. So when I have someone in my own work life that is miserable, I need to remind myself not that they're a shitty person, but that they're doing the wrong work right now or that are working in the wrong place. So if you have someone who's less skilled, find something that works to their skill level, honestly. Like um, a good example, like I know there's a few Comp 1531 students here because they, they've done the course and they see my name and they're like, I know that person. Um, but if you have someone that's like really struggling to contribute, then just be like, hey, honestly, can you just start randomly mashing input into our code until it breaks and then just like tell us when you see it break you know like whatever it is you can usually find a spot for someone to do some some good things um 
Peter says, what do you think about the intersection between business and CS? Where did you start learning about businesses? Oh, okay. So I've convinced nine people in my life so far to drop their commerce part of their dual degree. And I will continue to increase that tally when I can. Not really. I'm having a bit of, I'm having a bit of fun, even though I do think it's kind of stupid. Um, but it's don't do commerce or anything in the, the school of business because you have this notion in your head. And I've been there where you're like, I'm going to go learn about software. I'm going to go learn about business. And then I'm going to go like, use software to like, like lead a software business or something like that. It just doesn't work. It just, it just is not how the world works. Um, the best experience you can get with business is actually doing stuff surrounding business. And UNSW has the best entrepreneurship programs anywhere in the country by far. I'm not just saying that. Um, I'm not an extrovert enough to get involved in many of them, um, but they're kind of cool things. But um, to the question, uh, where did I start learning about businesses? By starting a business. I started a business in 2016 with some friends. It didn't go very well. We'd run it for two years. We were trying to compare meal kits. Like who's seen HelloFresh, Marley Spoon, um, all these other things. We realized that there's all these things out there and no one knows shit about them and no one knows how to figure out what works for them. So we tried to build a, think of it like a search engine to help people find out what works for them. So they could be like, I want vegan food and I want cheap vegan food and I want it pre-prepared and, and we would give them that stuff. And um, we built an entire functioning website and we had 200 clients and I was putting on suits and meeting people at Joe's Juice in the city, the stupid juice place. And like, we were chatting and they, we got there and they were like, who the hell are you? And then it was awkward. And there's all these horrible experiences and you have to go through the horrible experiences, but um, you just have to go do it, honestly. You can't, you definitely can't learn anything about business through, um, uh, you know, uni for sure. Um, and on that too, don't start a business with people that you think you're smarter than, genuinely. Um, best thing I've done with my last startup is I joined a business where I work with people who are legitimately like really talented. Because um, startups are defined, you think teamwork's hard? You should try teamwork when you're all invested in a business. It is a nightmare because everything matters now. You know, like, this your 1531 project. It doesn't matter that much. When you've all put like $30,000 into a business, things get like a lot more serious. So like, just be very careful about who you, you get in that stuff with. Um, uh, but yeah, just go do it. And I think the startup space is a great place to do it because if you're in a startup, no matter who you are, you're going to be more involved in the, the actual business decisions. You'll never learn anything about business joining... Um, uh, or like I joined Microsoft as an intern and my boss was like, I've been here for 24 years and now I'm the head of this and this and this. And if you just keep working, you can learn more about like the inner workings of the company. And it's like my ass, like you joined the company when it was like 5,000 people. Um, most of the people who like run big businesses, they come in laterally from smaller businesses anyway. Um, there's very few, and like you look at the CEO of Google, right? Started at Google at the start. That's because Google was tiny. So I think startups or small companies are a good place to get. Um, and this is asked, how many hours of sleep do I get? Um, I actually care a lot about sleep. There's two things I care about, sleep and water. If you sleep and you drink water, you would be amazed how far your body will take you. Genuinely. I eat so much crap. Um, but if you do those two things, sleep's not the best one at the moment. Term three has been very busy for me. Um, I generally have a rule that I try and get eight hours of sleep a night, but I don't. But anything less than six, the alarm bells uh, want a, a dinging on my head. Um, but I wake up really late, but like, there's a lot of people who are like, wow, Hayden sends emails at 2am. I, I try very hard to structure my days that I don't have. This is the first thing I have on today. Um, and I try very hard to structure my days that if I stay up late, I can wake up late. Um, and if I go to sleep early, I can wake up early. Cause if you don't sleep, it's all, everything's screwed. Um, I just tried, I tried to convince someone to drop business and they dropped CS instead. Oh, you, you failed then, didn't you? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I mean, a few people asked about teamwork stuff. I, I would just keep reminding people that just don't, teamwork is a lot like bills. You can't ever live your life waiting for your last bill to be paid. Right. I see a lot of young people do this. And I was like this. They're like, now you get older and you start paying rent and electricity and all these ongoing costs. You're like, God, I just want it to stop. Um, but you just have to actually like embrace it and um and just realize it's a part of life now. Same with crappy, same with crappy team members. And honestly, like 
if crappy if like you hate working with people if you just absolutely hate it then don't work with people go get like some random job where you just have to sit in a room by yourself and like do work that's totally fine um but don't think you're gonna like move through the professional world moving up through it by just like waiting for bad people to get out of your way and again i use this term bad people it reminds me of, by the way how's the trump election going has anyone looked i don't know sorry i've been worried about this all day ah it's still happening okay so the um the yeah nevada nevada um lost my train of thought about teamworks yes i i tell students this stat all the time um which is that you've seen the thing right that 90 percent like 90 percent of people think they're in the top half of intelligent people right i think it's one of the funniest things in the entire world that most people think they're in the smartest half of society and it's the same thing right i reckon if i polled 1531 students in particular i know there's other people who've done 1531 and i was like how many bad team members like do you think you're a good team member and how many bad team members do you exist do exist I'm sure 90% of students would say, how many students would say I'm a terrible team member? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just awful. Um, but most people would say other people are bad. So that's why I would still encourage people. When I talk about bad team members, what I'm really saying is that you're in a team where you aren't meshing well with people and you need to think about structures and systems and processes and roles where you can actually mesh well um, together. At three. Okay, cool. Yeah, Tom's talking at three um, about lots of secrets of CSC stuff. You should go to that too, because um, there's a lot of stuff in there that I am still learning today and it's taken me seven or eight years to learn. And many of it I wish I learned beforehand. So um, you should absolutely check that out. Um, I'll just answer a few more questions. I'm more cautious of other people's time. Um, A's asked, do I have any closing tips for a tech career based in Sydney in particular? The most common categories being telecom, data science, system admin, database admin. Um, I don't, it's a very broad question. Um, I would probably just encourage people to apply to as many places as you possibly can. That's about it. You don't know what kind of work you're going to like. You don't really know where you're going to find interest in stuff. And the best thing you can do is like spray and pray. Um, and things will bite at you. All of the opportunities that I have enjoyed in my life, I either didn't want or I didn't know existed. Um, I, I applied for Microsoft for the sake of it. And I thought it was a stupid company because I thought about Windows. And I was like, do I want to go work at Google where they're making maps and Android? Or do I want to go work at Microsoft where they're making like Windows Explorer? Um, and I didn't want it. I walked up to the interview and I tried really hard because I wanted to practice, but, um, and I said no to the first offer. And then later on, I thought about it and I read more about it and I was like, oh, that sounds really great. Um, so I would, I would try very hard just to like go wide and broad. I think the worst thing people can do is be like, this is what I want. And then I'm just going to go get it. Or like, I'm going to go tackle it. You have no idea what you want. None of us do. So just keep saying yes to things and keep, keep trying to do things. Um, and I think just a couple of these last questions that people did ask, I should probably shop staring screens because I'm not using it, um, is, uh, yeah, so people said, what, what technical skills are most valued in industry? Um, there is no good answer to that because it depends on the, the environment you're working in. You will find that big tech companies are far less interested in the specific skills you have because they'll, they just, they'll just have so much money, they'll just upskill you in other areas. Um, like you could have no background in Java and they'd just be like, yeah, you're working in the Java team now because we think you're a generally competent computer science student. Um, but I think once you get to smaller and medium sized companies, they will be a lot more specific with what, um, what they want you to do. Um, and what general skills are most valued in the industry? I, I like this question. There are two things that, um, Remember that everyone is human. This is the most important thing I think I could encourage anyone to think about when it comes to any kind of workplace. Everyone is human and they will fundamentally be looking at you and saying, does this seem like a pleasant person to be around, right? No one gets hired because they're a miserable genius, you know? Um, so uh, if nothing else, just try and make sure that you seem like it a generally appealing person to spend time with even if that's just being nice or smiling or asking questions, 
being curious. Um, you know, I think I think the weirdest the weirdest job offer I ever got was an interview with Freelancer, I think, a long time ago. I think it was an internship. And I went and did the interview and I just thought what they were doing was so cool that I spent like 45 minutes of the interview just like asking them questions about freelancer and how their business works and like how they make money. And everyone has the same question about freelancer. It's like, are you trying to employ me as a freelancer? Or, you know, are you about what what is this job? Um, so just try and generally be a pleasant person to be around. Um, and then someone said, what's the best part of the CS field? Um, probably that there are so few barriers about what we do in CS that we can we can enact change at scale like no other industry can. And I remind people of this all the time. They're like, oh, I can't wait for robots to start doing our garbage. And it's like, mark my words, robots doing manual labor, like collecting your garbage and cleaning your house. Like that isn't a Roomba, like an actual physical walking robot that like makes your bed. I, I think most of us will be well into retirement before a robot is making our bed for us. Absolutely. Um, because most other industries have to deal with a lot of physical constraints have to deal with costs. Um, most things don't get cheap until like, think about all the Boston dynamic stuff you've seen. How many years have you seen them making robots mildly better? You know, there's still, there's probably like a $2 million robot, but the crazy and scary, crazy and scary thing about software is how quickly you can create and make something available to people and improve on it. It's absolutely scary. Like some of the work, think about the incredible work. I always like look at Tesla. I don't want to work for Tesla anymore. It's a bit too big for my liking now, but I for years was like fascinated by their autonomous driving stuff because they do a lot of um, machine learning on like swarm, like swarm data, right? So they don't like program a car, how to drive. They do things like I, I give the example to people and this might not be a specific thing is, you know, they are recording a car's camera. Like you're driving your Tesla, you drive past a 50 sign and you're doing 60 and you slow your car down to 50 from 60. And they will take into account what that sign said. Maybe they can't quite see it because there's glare. So they'll see that glary sign that the computer couldn't quite read. They'll see what you did and they'll feed that all into giant engines, you know, ML stuff that'll figure out and draw connections and do all the self-driving for you, right? And it's like, the fact that we've gone from like non-self-driving, well, barely self-driving cars to that in a period of like five years, where you have these crazy systems of every, all this data coming together. Like there is no other real industry where you can do crazy things at scale like software. So um, that's by far the coolest thing about our industry. That's the main reason I, I kind of care about the work. Um, but I always have wanted to be, um, I always have wanted to work in, in uh, retail just because it sounds miserable. And then I probably realize how stupid I am. Um, Peter said, if you have a spray hose approach to industry goals, how do you make sure you have some structure in your professional life? Well, this is probably where I can't help you. I don't have a plan. I don't really know what I'm doing. I need to make enough money that I'm not poor. Um, and I don't know. Am I enjoying my work? Like my, my goal, I don't have professional goals at all. And I, I, I don't think, I, I think it's good to avoid it if you can. Some people can't and all power to you. You'll probably go further than me, but um, you know, I try and be a good person. I try and make sure I'm making enough money so that I, I don't have to work till I'm 80. Um, and I try and make sure I'm enjoying my work. And it, the thing is, if you, if you work hard at anything you're doing, if you work hard at anything you're doing, you will keep falling into better things. And most people will look at it as a career, right? I mean, pe I think people just call a career like, a career is just what people call stumbling around successfully in hindsight. Um, you know, I'm sure there's most people out there. I have, I have, a, I have a friend, um, you know, I have so, yeah, their, their parent was a police officer, right? Dropped, like finished high school, went straight, became a police officer. Um, eventually was regarded well enough to become a police prosecutor. So they paid them to study law part-time. So did like police prosecution, ended up working for health cover or something like that. Um, because they were like good at prosecuting stuff and they were like, well, you know, you can come and work in this other thing. And then they ended up starting a business from that. And then they sold a business and it's like, it looks so cool in hindsight. Right. But I'm sure like all of these people, just like everyone that they didn't set out, um, to do this stuff. I don't think anyone does. So just keep working hard. That's like, I think one of the early things I said was just like, take the plunge and move forward. Um, the worst thing you can do is slow down, I think. Um, cause as long as you're moving and working, um, th 
things will things will keep happening for you. Um, and I think maybe last question. I I could talk for hours, but that doesn't mean I should. So we'll do this one as the last question. Um, you can also do bad stuff with those low barriers to entry. Do you think ethics education is good enough in the comp centers? <laughs> So our co-pres with uh, our incumbent, co are you co-pres yet? I don't know how it works, probably not. Incumbent co-pres. Um, uh, incoming, yeah. Oh, incumbent's the wrong word, sorry. I'm really stupid. Um, do you think ethics education is good enough in the comp sci industry? Oh, honest to God, probably not. But like, we need to teach people how to be less miserable and like less difficult to work with. Like before I would worry about whether someone's like gonna, gonna be like, is it a good idea to, to track someone's data? It's like, that's important, but you know, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather we, we tackle actually like giving people more experience to, to work in teams in general. Um, and I think Mark Cheese talked about this as well. Um, this came up at a meeting last year, like when we talked about teamwork at unis. Um, and many of you know, in like 1531, we've started like moving more time away to like uh, mentoring, like teamwork mentoring. Um, and Mark pointed this out that like when he was an undergraduate um, or when he was tutoring a long time ago, they used to spend a lot of time like sitting down with, with students. And I think, I think if you ever wanted something from an educational system, it should be more time mentoring from, from uh, people. Um, what's your experience with elitism at UNSW? Coming from a rural public school, it definitely feels like this was a selective school bubble. Um, look, I find that weird. I was gonna talk about that in the... <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I was gonna talk about that in the, in the, in the chat. Um, originally, but um, I changed my mind because I thought it was a little bit specific. Um, I I don't think I, I find it I find it very hard to connect with people from the city. Um, it's not that I think they're bad, or I wouldn't even call it elitism, because um, I I hate regional people as much as I hate city people for different reasons, right? Um, like people talk about city people as like oh you know they're so like. They only care about themselves and stuff. But you know what? I see like city people go and queue up for like 20 minutes to have dinner calmly. When I'm like back at home and I see someone having to like wait in line at a Woolworths, they start throwing shit. They're like, what the fuck is taking so like they start absolutely losing their mind because they and my even my dad. I was with my dad, love my dad, but like, but like what happened? I was like driving and he's like, we're driving at like 70 and an 80 zone. He's like, this place is full of too many people. And I'm just like, relax, you know, like this isn't your place, you know? And um, so I think, I think there's pros and cons to it, but um, I've kind of learned that there's, there's just a lot of things about, um, you know, people that grow up in the city that in general, I, I will struggle to, to connect with. Um, and most of it is not because they're uh, bad people or anything like that. most of it is just because they, they just deal with things very differently. Um, in terms of for better and for worse sometimes um you know I, I as i said i like i like my like city based i mean like i've lived out of home now for like eight and a half years and i have friends that still live at home and there are always parts of our friendship that are just stressed slightly because we're just we're just living very different lives all the time you know like i'm arguing with my real estate um and something's gone wrong and like I, like i i had a i had a bicycle crash a few years ago and like I don't have any family here. I walked myself to the hospital, right? And I remember that day I walked myself to the hospital to like get myself fixed because, you know, like I was kind of this independent adult. And meanwhile, my friend was like sending me photos of the new like $200 sunglasses that people have bought, uh, bought them, you know? And I was like, what a like a different world. And it's really hard too, because some people are like, they don't like the city, but um, the thing is like people in the city are generally more wealthy. And as well, people at, at like our uni are generally more wealthy um, than like the rest of Sydney. So I think it's, there's definitely no badness to any of it. I think it's just, it's just a very different world sometimes. And also like I have friends from proper rural Australia. I'm very specific to like call where I grew up a regional area because rural Australia is like, um, like, you know, little towns that don't even have like a um, McDonald's, right? Um, and, and regional places are a bit bigger. So all those different experiences are very different. Um, and rural kids look at me and think like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a weirdo. Cause they, they just like, you know, they grew up on like farms and stuff and they see me like, I love my little 
apartment with no backyard. I don't live in an apartment. I live in someone's room in an apartment, but um, I don't, I don't care for a backyard because we'd never had a big backyard as a kid. Whereas I have lots of rural friends who are like, they just don't understand how I can sit inside all day because they're used to like running around the paddock on quad bikes and shit like that. I mean, just to be clear, like I grew up in Ballina. I didn't grow up in the desert. Um, it's really the same as the suburbs. It's like living in Penrith. The only difference with place, people that grow up regionally is that most people don't, um, uh, most people don't have big opportunities. Um, anyway, I'm talking about nothing now, but I, I really didn't articulate myself well at the end, but I just wanted to speak to those people. Um, I don't think there's a ton of elitism. I think it's just a different background. Um, you know, I see elitism come from real people who are like, I want my big cars and stuff. We all just care about different things and it's good to learn from each other. And um, it can stress relationships sometimes, but it's all okay. I make it this, uh, I see like, now I'm like sitting here being like, oh shit, anyone who like lives in the city, they're like, oh, Hayden Loki hates me. <laughs> they're like, oh no, he's going to think I'm like some annoying city slicker, but no, I've become a city slicker. Um, my family doesn't recognize me anymore. Like I'll be like, yeah, let's go out to the, the restaurant. You can't even book and you just stand in line for half an hour and it's loud and crowded and people are bumping you. And everyone I ever grew up with is like, that sounds horrible. Absolutely horrible. Um, but, you know, anyway. So thank you for coming. <laughs> really strong for the, till the last 10 minutes. Um, and uh, my the only thing I'd say is please go and talk to people about what sucks about their life if nothing else. People you look up to, people you think are good, ask them questions. What's, what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you in the last couple of years? Where do you think your biggest failure is? What are you most worried about failing? Um, bring those people down to earth because we're all the same. Um, you're just looking at it from different lenses. So I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks, Trey. And um, oh, Juliana, is that how I say your name? I don't think I've had to verbalize yeah. that yet. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Hayden. I'm sure everyone is in the same boat as me and got heaps out of today. Um, we're gonna send out an email with a recording of today's talk. So stay tuned for that. And also hop onto the Secrets of CSE talk if you want more CSE stuff. Um, and the barbecue um, information will be up either later today or tomorrow. If you want one of the CSE soft barbecues we used to have in person, it'll be at Centennial Park. So more information coming. Thanks everyone for coming along and thank you again to Hayden.